This is Perspectivas Latinas, a community service of CAN TV. I'm your host, Juan Carlos Hernandez. Since 1980, St. Augustine College has worked with the Latino community and looks to continue addressing many of their needs in our city. College President Andrew Sund is here to talk about their history and their vision going forward. Welcome. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be here in the program. Well, thanks for coming out again. We just had yeah. you on recently, so. No, very happy to be here. Great. Uh, let's start off by talking about you and how you came to St. Augustine, and then we'll get into the history of uh, the institution. Well, thank you for that opportunity. Mm -hmm. I actually came to St. Augustine uh, mm -hmm. many years ago, the first time around, 1991. Mm -hmm. I was a very recent uh, graduate from Northwestern University, fa having finished my master's degree in history, mm -hmm. and I started working as a faculty member, and little by little I got engaged in a variety of other uh, programs at St. Augustine College, and I just loved the mission, so uh, I, stayed, I stayed there for a long time. Uh, I worked at St. Augustine from 1991 through 2003 mm -hmm. in a variety of positions. I was a faculty member in English, but I was also an academic advisor. I was in institutional research. I was wow. the dean of students. I was uh, the vice, acting vice president for two years. Uh, How did you juggle all of that? Uh, well, <laughs> I, I, I was someone that uh, became engaged with the institution. Mm -hmm. So I decided, essentially, I decided that I would do whatever fit it best at a particular time mm -hmm. for the work. And in colleges, there's many things that we do in the background that people may not always realize, that we're involved in uh, uh, accreditation processes and uh, working with the Department of Education with the state of Illinois. And all that background word is something that I started becoming engaged with and led me to different positions. I left the college in 2003 and I worked for the City Colleges of Chicago for four years, mm -hmm. at, mostly as a dean in, in the far south side, but I was fortunate enough in 2008 to come back as the president of the college in 2008, and that's where I'm still at today. Wow, so you juggled, you left, and, and you're back. Um, but as I said in the intro, this institution's been around since 1980. Uh, tell us about that history and what, uh, what inspired it, because it's the only bilingual school uh, well, right, the only bilingual higher education institution in the Midwest, right? Correct, and actually there's probably none in the nation that do exactly what we do. There's others mm -hmm. that do something similar mm -hmm. things, but not exactly what we do. And yes, the college was born in, in 1980, but it was born of a process that really began in the 1970s, where there was a group of professionals, mostly in, in psychology, mm -hmm. that worked in the mental health system of the Chicago mm -hmm. area. Part of the work was to receive cases, uh, they were case managers, cases from the court system, and they would have uh, uh, immigrants, uh, mm -hmm. uh, Hispanics, refer to them uh, because they were all bilingual, they spoke Spanish. Right. And they would interview these people that were referred for mental services, mental health services, because they believed they had, uh, the court system believed they had adjustment problems, they had psychological problems, et cetera. Mm -hmm. And they would interview them, and little by little they started developing this philosophy at the mental health service clinic that they really had no mental health problems, wow. they really did not speak English well, mm -hmm. and did not have the educational background to be successful in the Chicago area. So it says, well, we really need as a school, mm. not mental health services. Right. What we really need is to provide the education, learn the English, the English language, acquire the skills and knowledge necessary to be successful in the society, uh, and that's going to make them make them adjust and be successful in the United States. And that led to the birth of St. Augustine College. First, they worked. Uh, this group of people worked with other institutions right. in the Chicago area, but little by little, eventually became a college in 1980 authorized to operate by the Illinois Board of Higher Education and accredited by the Higher Learning Commission like any other institution in the Chicago area. Right, and you're affiliated with a church, right? Well, the original mm -hmm. founder, is a, it's a very loose affiliation because okay. the founder, Dr. Carlos Plazas, was an Episcopal priest. Okay. He was a, a clinical psychologist and an Episcopal priest. Okay. And this, the work for this college really came out of a psychology work, mm. but he received some help financial help from the Episcopal Church, mm -hmm. and that we've always had a very friendly relationship with the Episcopal Church, but we're not Episcopalian in the sense that mm -hmm. uh, uh, none of our curriculum uh, mm -hmm. involves any issues related to that church. No theology courses. No theology are... courses. Mm -hmm. Also, um, the college is a nonprofit institution, mm -hmm. and as such, it has a volunteer board of trustees, 
and the <coughs> board of trustees hires the president, which is me, right. and uh, the board of trustees is not managed by the church either. Mm -hmm. We do have some Episcopalians in the board of trustees that mm -hmm. are very friendly, very supportive, right. but they're not, they're not managing our institution. Okay, so um, this it was a, a responding to a need, and there was collaboration with other institutions, and eventually you, ha you got your own building, right? Mm -hmm. That's the building up on Argyle. Uh, what were the first uh, programs that you that you responded, you know, that you formed to respond to that need you were seeing out in the community? Yeah. Well, the first uh, programs were associate degrees, very similar to a community college curriculum, mm -hmm. in the area, uh, one degree in the area of liberal arts to help people transfer to other schools, and some associates of applied science in uh, traditional areas such as accounting, business administration, and business management. Over time, we developed many more programs. As computers became mm -hmm. popular in 1980, they were still not too <laughs> important, but we have a computer information systems. Then we're also very involved in early childhood education, culinary arts, mm -hmm. social work, respiratory therapy, and many, many other areas. Mm -hmm. But the most important element of the philosophy when the college started, which is still there today, was developing a bilingual curriculum for the immigrant student, mm -hmm. which means that students at St. Augustine College, and this was true in 1980 and it's true today, people that do not speak English well, right. they can come mm -hmm. and take content classes such as Introduction to Psychology, American History, mm -hmm. Mathematics in Spanish at the same time that they're learning English. So that by the time they graduate, they can have both. They can have the skills and knowledge that an associate degree uh, provides, mm -hmm. but also be fluent in English so that you can um, uh, survive in an English speaking environment. Because mm -hmm. the reality is that when you're, and, and those of us that have had to learn languages, we know mm -hmm. you never finish learning a new language. <laughs> you're always learning and, uh, and it, it takes time. So uh, what, how do you respond to students or p people in the community that say, well, why am I learning this in Spanish? What I need to do is learn English. Um, that, uh, that's kind of a waste of time. I'm sure you've had those questions. Right, and I'm, I'm not saying that our uh, curriculum is one that serves everybody in the mm -hmm. Chicago area, but it serves many people very well. Mm -hmm. And the traditional approach has been for the immigrant student to go to English-only classes at a community right. college or some setting and eventually enter uh, college-level uh, classes. That takes a long time, and many people get frustrated along the way. They never reach the collegiate level because they're stuck at intermediate ESL, English mm -hmm. as a Second Language programs. Uh, we believe that what we offer is very good for some kind of students, particularly the first generation in college, which is the majority mm -hmm. of our students. We serve them very well because, as I just mentioned, learning a language is difficult. Learning the English language is difficult, difficult for anybody at any level of education. If on top of that you're an immigrant, right. uh, you're working to make ends meet, and you don't have a background education that really prepared you for collegiate level work, mm -hmm. it's doubly hard. So you take English, it's hard, but at our institution, you're also beginning to take some collegiate work in Spanish, mm. psychology, history, math, and many of our students, is one of the most rewarding parts of our work, by the way, mm -hmm. suddenly discover the intellectual side that they had, that they had not seen in their lives because they were so busy raising children or right. just working. Suddenly they discover that they can speak with a professor about interesting topics. They can read a textbook. They can run summaries about what's going on in the textbook in your own language. Discover your intellectual side and that really balances the frustrations we all have mm -hmm. learning a new language so that it leads to, for students to succeed uh, intellectually, emotionally, and, and earn the degree that they, they set out to do. I'm not in any way advocating that this is a program for everybody, right. but it's a program that serves very well the population that we have targeted. Okay, so let's say um, I'm an uh, immigrant that came here and I've been working a few years. I have a young family, but I, I want to do more. I really didn't, I didn't finish high school, uh, mm -hmm. let's say uh, in Mexico, for example, um, and I didn't really have a solid foundation in my own language because I just went through uh, junior high or la secundaria and um, I wanna go to St. Augustine, what kind of support will I find? Because I know I'm lacking in some areas, and, but I, I know I can do it. 
Yeah, there's many things mm -hmm. to, for, for the immigrant students that we do that is very unique to us. And by the way, I would like to say, and maybe we can talk about it later, mm -hmm. that we do have many students that were born here in our second, third generation, mm -hmm. and it's a different story for them. It's very interesting. Sure. But for the immigrant student, as you mentioned, someone that has a young family, wants to improve their uh, earning potential, their their ability right. to work, but they never finish high school, where first of all, uh, what, what we do is that we do have a GED program where people can do for free mm -hmm. the high school equivalency that we call the GED in the United States. We this is for free for everyone? For free for everyone, yeah. Okay. It's a preparation, like a preparation classes for that, so that eventually you can uh, take the GED exam and pass oh. it. Uh, some people can do this in as little as 12 weeks. 12 weeks. Other people take longer, depends mm -hmm. on your background education right. and, and where you are. But we've had very good success with people, particularly if you have like ninth grade level, as mm -hmm. you said, a secundaria in Mexico or mm -hmm. uh, other names. Yeah. They can, uh, they can uh, do it in 12 weeks if they're motivated and prepared and you can do the GED. Then you can come into our collegiate program. And for this working parents that you suggest, uh, as an example, we have many things. Uh, if you have your GED credential, well, you're uh, officially mm -hmm. admitted to the college. Okay. You will have classes according to your English level, some in Spanish, some in English, depending on your English level, mm -hmm. you will be preparing in English. We will have um, courses in, either in the morning or the evening according to your work schedule mm -hmm. or on weekends. So if someone works a traditional nine to five uh, type work week, you can take classes in the evening at St. Augustine College. And it's the same program as in the morning, same faculty, same people. Many people now don't have that kind of traditional uh, hours anymore, right. so maybe it's more convenient to take classes in the morning or even to mix it, that you take some in the mm. morning, some in the evening, right. some on Saturday, you can do that. Mm -hmm. We have several locations in the Chicago area so that we try to be close to your home. Mm -hmm. In the north side, we're in the area of Uptown, which is um, an Argyle, 1345 West Argyle, but we also have locations, which again, the same faculty go to all locations. Same faculty. Same faculty go to They're all up locations. And down, up and down up the and city. Up and down the city. So there's no difference in the quality of the of the programming we have wow. in Humble Park, mm -hmm. in Little Village, and in the far south, in the east side of south Chicago. Side. And we're also uh, very soon opening a new location in Aurora. Wow. Uh, we've received authority oh, from to. the Illinois Board of Higher Education to operate in Aurora, and we just bought a building that we're going to be uh, working in Aurora also. Many of our people are suburban now. They live out there, and we want to be able to offer um, uh, services, uh, educational services to them. That's but exciting. It's very exciting. Mm -hmm. But also, Juan Carlos, perhaps the most important thing, I usually leave it for the end, but maybe it should be at the <laughs> beginning, is that we are very affordable. Mm. We have the lowest cost of private higher education in the Chicago area, and we work very closely with many financial aid systems to assure that the great majority of our students really do not pay it out of their pocket or they pay very minimal amounts in order to study. That's a huge challenge for most folks now because uh, higher education has gotten so expensive and people are getting in debt or doing a degree very, especially yes. with people that have to work and support a family, they're doing very little at, at a time. Uh, how do you say, how do you, how have you created these funds, or yes. you've reached out to financial aid institutions, to corporations, or whom to help you out? Well, what we do is the following. First of all, mm -hmm. we keep our tuition significantly low, mm -hmm. which is very hard, and sometimes we really don't have the niceties that other mm -hmm. schools do. We don't have athletic programs, dormitories, or things like that. Right. We're a school for people who want to come and study. Our faculty are just as well prepared as the faculty in any other college. Mm -hmm. You come, you do your work, and that allows us to keep our tuition lower. Mm -hmm. uh, but then uh, most of our students receive financial aid from public sources, the federal government and the state government. Okay. The federal government is the Pell Grant, and the state is the MAP Award. And with those two scholarships, you can just about cover tuition. Okay. However, we do work very hard in private fundraising, trying to obtain funds from corporations, from individuals, mm -hmm. from foundations that help cover gaps or also help to provide some assistance to students that do not qualify for the public assistance to help. Such uh, as students, undocumented. Such as undocumented students. Okay. Uh, we cannot say that that is as robust as the public, uh, the Pell Grant and the MAP Award, but we do work very hard at trying to obtain additional assistance for those people so that they can move forward also with, with, with their lives. Mm -hmm. So the reality is that 
we have over 1,600 students at St. Augustine College, mm -hmm. and really over 90% of them uh, are receiving financial aid, and most of them as a package that they really do not have to pay out of the market. Wow, wow. So you mentioned um, financial aid that was available, the two big ones that were available to um, students with a social security number, uh, the Pell. The Pell Grant. And that's a federal, right? That's federal. Mm -hmm. And the MAP? The MAP Award, which is the state of Illinois. Okay, and how do those work? Uh, how do we? How do I get those? I have to fill out the FAFSA. Yeah, it's mm -hmm. uh, like uh, it's uh, it's like any other school at St. Augustine College. There is in, in the United States this mm -hmm. universal form you complete, mm -hmm. which can be done online now, which is the FAFSA. Uh, you complete the FAFSA, and in in our case, you would put St. Augustine College as one of the institutions you're interested in. Mm -hmm. So our Office of Financial Aid will receive that information, and through that. Uh, we will determine how much uh, scholarship money you qualify. We complement that if necessary with other sources mm -hmm. and create a financial aid package for you. Mm -hmm. And we do that when you first come in and it continues year after year. year, after year. And based on your grades, on your progress, there may be other opportunities because we have scholarships that are based a little more on how you're doing later. Okay. And the map uh, is the state of Illinois and that's, um, we had spoken about that previously. Tell us about that again, please. It's a, it's an unfortunate thing that the MAP Award is not funded at the level that everybody that needs one qualifies mm -hmm. for mm -hmm. it. So it gets kind of difficult for many students because uh, uh, the MAP Award, you apply for it with a FAFSA, but the problem is that it, the funds are depleted very quickly. So students need to apply like in January and February for the academic year that follows, that begins in August. Right. So like right now we're in April, and the money's uh, gone. And it's gone. Wow. Um, and, uh, but, but we still, even if you don't have the MAP award, we will create a financial aid package for you with special funding that we, we obtain from other sources. Because we know that if you study with us the following year, you probably will get the MAP award if we help you apply for it early enough. Mm -hmm. So you will, you will have that, that advantage. So we really help all students uh, in the best way that we can trying to obtain the financing so that they can come to school. So we have, you know, our bilingual program. We have mm -hmm. several locations, classes in the morning and the evening, and a, a strong financial aid program to help people succeed. And that's really not all. We offer many other services mm -hmm. that uh, we have free parking, which is very unusual <laughs> in, in a university. And we in our city. A, yeah, <laughs> we have a child care program. So you could bring your that's, children that's to crucial, class. Right? Yeah, mm -hmm. you can bring your children to the college. We will take care of them while, while we, uh, uh, while, you, while you attend classes. How, well, and what are the hours for that? Uh, they're during class time, so you mm -hmm. can bring your children at 9 in the morning uh, until uh, 1 p.m. or so, which is usually mm -hmm. our morning schedule. Or if you study in the evening, you can bring them at, ni uh, at 6, 6.30 p.m., and they can stay until past 10. We have staff there that stay until past 10. They will help them with their homework or other activities. Wow. And it's uh, not quite free, but mm -hmm. it's a very, very low cost. Mm -hmm. um, uh, most students for childcare at St. Augustine College, pay $100 for the semester. Wow. That's, that's virtually nothing that's compared nothing. to what people pay for childcare in other situations. And you, how do you subsidize that? I'm just curious. It's really part of our fundraising efforts to collect mm -hmm. money for childcare. Part of the tuition payment that students make is mm -hmm. goes towards that. But we do it because we understand that it's a major need in the population we serve. Right, right, right. Definitely. Um, I'm curious, um, going, back to financial aid um, and supporting students, uh, you say undocumented students obviously don't get as much help. And you, um, they all, people who do not have a social security number should also not apply for FAFSA, correct? No, they should not. Uh, it's a recommendation that I always give people. They should not apply for FAFSA because it creates uh, several problems and it, it could be kind of detrimental in the future if eventually they have a social mm -hmm. security number. So it's best not to apply, but you can approach colleges and universities okay. and apply for other sources of institutional aid. And, mm -hmm. um, and that's what we do at St. Augustine College. If, if, if you don't have a social security number, you can approach our financial aid office, fill out an institutional financial aid form, 
and and we see what we can do for you. It's not not as good, but it's still uh, getting an education is so important that we tru truly recommend everybody in whatever status they have to try and find the best options they have to complete a collegiate education. Definitely. Now you mentioned earlier that there was a difference between students and working with students that come from Latin America and those coming out of CPS. What has been that difference? What have you found? Yeah. Well, it's uh, interesting. I like to mention that because although the college was created, as we were discussing, to serve an immigrant population, mm -hmm. that was the first origin, and the bilingual program is such an important aspect of our, of our mission, mm -hmm. yet about half the students we receive now mm -hmm. have been born in the United States. They're wow. second or third generation. When they do the English uh, placement uh, exam mm -hmm. that we have, they place at levels that are for native speakers, mm -hmm. native speakers of English. Mm -hmm. So we obviously play a different role for them. Uh, okay. We're not playing the role of, oh, well, I need a place where Spanish is spoken or I'm not going to make it. Right. We play a role of an institution that is culturally sensitive to your background mm -hmm. uh, for, for the Latino community, offers the programming that you're looking for in the uh, in, in the and at the convenience level that you wanted, close to home, mm -hmm. evening classes, the right. child care program, uh, the financial aid, all those things still apply uh, to mm -hmm. people that have been born right. here. And English is, learning English is not an issue. They speak English already, but they still need all this other support in order to be successful in, 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 college, in college level work. And uh, additionally, what I said first, I think is very mm -hmm. important for them, a culturally friendly environment. Right. If, an environment that you feel that you're not the odd, different one, mm -hmm. but you're really part of a community. Why is that important? What have you found in your own experience through all of these years of working with the Latino community and in education? Yeah. Uh, the, the honest truth is that our educational system, and this is sort of part of my own philosophy of education, is mm -hmm. that our higher education mm -hmm. system in the United States was developed for people that have a uh, background that is going to make them successful in it. People that are uh, more uh, wealthy, middle class, the ch uh, professionals, mm -hmm. the children of professionals, and higher education was designed for them. And many in our community, in the in the Latino community, we don't come from that background. Right. We we have a, a low income background. It was very difficult to go to school. It was very difficult to do homework because we have to help our parents work mm -hmm. or or help with siblings, or we just live in smaller spaces where you don't really have the ability to study. And that's something that traditional colleges don't understand. But we at St. Augustine truly do understand, and we create the environment for you to be successful. We understand all the, all the issues that have affected your education in the past. We don't worry about them. We're here now. We look into the future, and we create a welcoming environment where everybody is like you. Everybody in the institution is like you. Mm -hmm. Our cafeteria serves the same food that you would eat at home, and uh, <laughs> as only an anecdotal example, so that you feel like you're at home. Wow, well, that's great. Now, um, we're getting close to the end of the program, and I'm curious about, and I'm sure you have many, um, probably too many to mention here, but um, the first student that comes to mind, somebody that's left your institution um, and has gone on, and maybe they earned a, an advanced degree, um, or they just have a very a solid life and and mm -hmm. St. Augustine was part of that. Tell me about one one example please. We, we have thousands of students that have graduated from mm -hmm. St. Augustine College and are making a big difference uh, mm -hmm. in their lives. One particular example that comes to mind is a person, a woman, that uh, studied uh, early childhood education with mm -hmm. us, continued at another university, finished a bachelor's degree in education, became a public school teacher, mm -hmm. um, uh, specialized in special education, mm -hmm. later, uh, later earned a master's degree, mm -hmm. and now has been part of the Chicago public school system for over 20 years as, a, as an advanced uh, a teacher in special education. We wow. have other graduates in, in the public uh, mm -hmm. service working in the health department, mm -hmm. opening their own businesses, restaurants, everywhere. Everywhere you go in the Chicago area, you will find graduates of St. Augustine College that 
have made it into that uh, that economic environment. Are there any plans to develop that alumni network to some extent? Yeah, no, we are developing it uh, mm -hmm. little by little, uh, and uh, we we always welcome uh, news mm -hmm. from our alumni. Uh, a lot of this happens electronically now through <laughs> Facebook right. and other other means uh, because it's uh, they're they're our best ambassadors. Mm -hmm. Our mm -hmm. alumni are our best ambassadors in showing. Uh, what a difference higher education can make. Mm -hmm. And it is still true, despite the difficulties we see in this nation uh, with the economic situation that we've lived in the past uh, few years, and despite the fact that it has gotten more expensive to earn a collegiate right. degree, it is still true that it's the most secure and fastest way of making it out. And if even you look at unemployment rates right now, co college graduates have a much lower unemployment rate than everybody else. So it is something that we want for everybody in our community so that we can make the difference. We know that our community is growing in numbers. We have many more Latinos than ever, mm -hmm. ever before, but we're still not occupying the spaces we should at the professional level, and that's what St. Augustine College is there for. Okay, one uh, final question because um, yeah, we're, we're pretty much out of time. Uh, what has kept you in this? I mean, you've mentioned some of it very briefly. Tell me uh, briefly why you've stayed in education. Well, because I truly believe mm -hmm. in education as a tool that can help us um, be successful in life. And I truly believe that uh, higher education needs to be open, needs to be democratic, mm. meaning that everybody should have an opportunity to earn a higher education degree. It's not for everybody. I, I understand that many people simply do not want to for a variety of reasons, but everybody should have the opportunity to do so. And there shouldn't be financial restraints, constraints, or any other kind that stop you from having that ability of at least trying to earn a degree in higher education. And to me, that's what's motivated me to work at St. Augustine College, to work in higher education, to make sure that we maintain institutions that are accessible to our community and to all uh, communities that have not have access to higher education in the past. Wow, that's so well, well said. Thank you for coming out today and sharing so much of your story and St. Augustine's story. Well, thank you very much, Juan Carlos. It's always a pleasure to be here. Thanks. Perspectivas Latinas is a community service of CAN-TV. If your nonprofit organization would like to work with CAN-TV, call 312-738-1400 and ask for nonprofit services. Tune into Perspectivas Latinas for local issues and concerns every Thursday at 8.30 p.m. on CAN-TV 21. I'm Juan Carlos Hernandez. Thank you for joining us.